All right, right then, yeah. uh, moving on, we have a panel on data centers, which um, we, we may know have become uh, an important uh, asset class, seeing that quite a bit of uh, business world is moving a lot of the activities online. Um, I know at yesterday's conference, we discussed uh, things around brick and mortar and then the cloud. Um, data centers uh, are a key part of that move and um, discussing um, how we can make sense uh, of data center design in Africa and um, what will work best considering um, our unique environment. Uh, we have Michelle Jackson, uh, a DCPM expert uh, from Turner and Townsend, who will be leading uh, the next uh, panel. So, Michelle, uh, glad to see you. Uh, welcome, and I hand over to you. Thank you, I appreciate the introduction. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, so, just as an introduction, I guess, to, to data center design, um, two years ago, before I got into all of this, uh, I made a throwaway comment that, you know, what's so hard about a DC? It's a, a big warehouse with lots of power and cooling. Little did I know that it's um, quite a complex, quite a, a, a service-driven, integrated building. Um, and there are lots of nuances to DC design. So. Um, I'm joined on, on, on the panel today um, by Wendy Saruti, who is the Head of um, Cost Management at Turner and Townsend. Um, hi, Wendy. Uh, hi. She has also put together the um, data center benchmarking um, uh, tool for, for Turner and Townsend that we use when we, we do estimating and, and so on on, on on data centers. Uh, we have Raymond Glass uh, from Dimension Data. Um, he's got 24 years of experience in data centers and ICT, and he's engineered some, some complex solutions across Africa and the Middle East. Um, and his more uh, recent focus um, on edge and hyperscale data center design and construction. Um, Thank hi, you. Raymond. It's a privilege. Thank you. And then also uh, joining us is Johan Tablanche from Schneider Electric. Um, he's the GM for Schneider Electric's cloud and, and service providers. Uh, he's an electronic engineer and he's worked for government and private sector in various roles um, for, for companies delivering power electronics and power systems. And um, yeah, he's our go-to guy when it comes to, to big complex systems. Um, and then lastly, welcome, welcome, Johan. <laughs> and then lastly, we've got Felix uh, Vianian. Uh, he is um, from Arup Consulting Engineers. Um, they're a global multidisciplinary engineering um, firm. He's got 22 years of industry experience and it cuts across several sectors, um, including mission critical applications such as data centers, as well as commercial, residential, industrial, and transport and infrastructure sectors. Um, at the moment, he's focused on managing delivery of projects um, of varying complexities, um, and uh, he joins us today as uh, our design expert um, on data centers. Welcome, Felix. Thank you for having me. Okay, so, um, yeah, I think as a start, uh, and this is a, a conference that's about investors, and, and, and we've had a lot of investors approaching us and, and property developers approaching us. Um, in the recent months saying we want to get into the data center space and we're interested in, in in how we can market our properties and whether or not our properties are suitable for data centers and you know it's it's a little different from from your normal commercial office space or your retail space when it looks when, when you're looking at data center site selection so i think as an intro we we need to say that, you know if you're looking to get into data centers you need to know the size of your site. What can it? What is its capacity? So you're going to have to look at getting someone in to do a big master, sort of high level uh, look at that footprint and say, well, how big can we make this thing? But even before you get there, do you have resilient power supplies? Do you have? Are you close to a fiber route? Um, and then there's the subtler things like, are you next to residential areas because these things are noisy? Um, are you? have you taken into consideration your physical security characteristics? So not necessarily your IT security, which is critical, but for your physical security, things like flight paths and access and so on. So, and Wendy, I think um, just starting with you, 
<laughs> there's an upfront investment in understanding whether your site is good enough. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, I mean, we had a discussion the other day about this and how important yeah. it is and that um, clients should really make sure that they don't overlook this, the due diligence portion of a project, um, where they are, are doing these initial assessments because really um, those initial assessments will, will really dictate what you plan to invest on that project. Um, and if if you make a small mistake here, it actually adds up into big millions. Um, so very, very important from our side to make sure that the due diligence is carried out correctly. I have a feeling we lost Michelle. Okay, I'll pick up then. <laughs> I think if we carry on to the next question, how... Does the size of a data center inform some of the decisions on design and planning in West Africa? Felix, can you maybe touch on that one? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question. And I think yeah, the size of data centers um, will primarily manifest itself in the extent of infrastructure uh, required to operate the data center and the physical um, space needed to accommodate the IT capacity and the associated infrastructure. Invariably, the bigger the data center um, IT capacity, the more infrastructure that will be required and in itself lend itself to the issue of land availability and suitability as uh, Michelle uh, emphasized during um, the introduction. Now, irrespective of the size, one needs to emphasize that um, there are certain minimum requirements for the siting of data centers. And as you alluded to um, um, earlier, uh, a, a due diligence needs to be made uh, with regards to noise, pollution, availability of suitable and reliable um, electricity connectivity to um, uh, fiber systems or, or telecom telecom systems and security. So all, all these, all these have to be considered irrespective of the size, but obviously it becomes more complex the bigger the the facility. Now, if you if you look at this in the context of West Africa, um, many of the attributes, many of these requirements to sites, the data centers which also affect the size, are uh, actually uh, available in already urban built areas, although sparsely, which creates in itself the added challenge. How big can you build within an urban area in West Africa? Plus the steep challenge in ensuring that the facility in itself does not create a negative impact to that environment. So yes, size matters. Um, the bigger, the, the bigger, the more challenges you have to resolve. Absolutely. Um, and just on that, where does most of the equipment typically come from, and how does that con um, feed into the considerations of design? I don't know, Ray. Will you touch on that one? Good. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Wendy. Uh, thank you, Felix. So you've captured that well. So, you know, from a procurement perspective these days, negotiations are typically driven in price uh, and, and by global competitiveness in products that are on par technically, you know. So on a like-for-like -like parity, there's very little difference in the products. I mean, uh, they offered today are, are quite, um, uh, are all driven around sustainability. And it comes really down to the best suited product that is uh, best supported and meets the local conditions and the local challenges, you know, service reliability um, and how that relates to the life of the product are, are certainly key considerations for business and business enablement today. You know, data centers prefer operations, uh, 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 de-risking and, uh, you know, the typical one-stop shop of supply chain um, in procurement is, is a high-risk component for larger data centers, you know, and, the diversification in procurement uh, through strategic initiatives uh, is, is really a, a big parity we're seeing today. Uh, you know, the reality check in design, uh, good practices and security therein 
um, you know, is in the product uh, being supported well uh, locally. You know, the availability of critical sparing is a very important part. So whether there's an upfront investment in the data center operator or operations versus highly skilled, trained engineers uh, and technicians, where, you know, provides continuity in, in business. You know, and certainly what we're seeing from a global perspective with larger data centers is a lot of the operators are bringing in-house first level support and maintenance, uh, certainly as a regime in, in driving business, uh, uh, ad, uh, you know, adversity in, uh, and tolerance in risk uh, uh, as, a, as a great parity therein, you know. Continuous operations and sustainability are a parallel medium as cadence for operations we believe in, you know, with continuous investment uh, in supporting staff and enablement programs. You know, the design considerations need to be a collaborative investment from the outset, you know, not just from handover, or, you know, in data center building construction. You know, this, the secret to success is really what I believe in. You know, and examples of these is how we de-risk uh, through partnership in evaluation criteria. You know, what we do find from global practices, engineering practices, certainly, you know, what works globally, not necessarily works locally, you know. So uh, with higher demand on automation of infrastructure, one has to question the integrity of simplicity, you know, and uh, how that relates to local experience, safe set of hands. Uh, thank you, uh, Wendy. And uh, thanks, I think also just from your hand side, your hand, do you want to touch on sort of where this equipment is coming from? Yeah, so Ray stole the show. Yeah, he, he said it he all. Did, eh? <laughs> yeah, he just left me with a couple of a couple of points to to address. But generally, Schneider being a, a global company, um, having factories all over the world. Uh, we ship from China, from USA, from European Union, India, Africa, CIS. Um, it really depends. You know, design consultants tend to favor their country of origin. We, we've seen that a lot. So when it comes down to who's your consultant, we know where they're going to, to try and source most of the products from. But also there's a big difference between um, what the local standards actually will allow them, and it normally takes precedence. So uh, with global shipping challenges, um, we really see a, a tendency uh, from most of our uh, customers to, to start trying to force to use local supply as much as possible, local subcontracting, even local production in, uh, in country. And it's really to, to stem the cost of, of, of logistics. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a challenging times that we're currently in. Uh, I can't say that we're doing the same thing today what we did two years ago. Um, and then the internet giants, uh, they also have the, their own way of doing the, the big colo companies have their own, uh, can I say, preferences when it comes to a country of origin and taking into consideration, you know, the U.S. probably still sit with 65, 70 percent of the data center infrastructure. Uh, they were really leading this uh, for the last 20 years. So a lot of the products that we, we supply into the bigger uh, corporates would come from uh, the same countries of origin. But yeah, it's, it's an opening market. It's, it's an exciting market. We, we are currently at Schneider. We are localizing a lot of our manufacture that, uh, that we haven't done here for the last 10, 15 years. And it's, it's very successful at the moment. Thank you. Thanks, Johan. Um, so, Felix, in talking about the, the sort of that, that um, push and pull between uh, global parts and components and systems and, and local builds and, and, and availability, how does uh, exchange rate volatility impact the way you design these systems in, in West Africa? So that, that's, that's a very good question. And I, I think I'll, I'll start by stating that the issue of exchange rate volatility obviously transcends the data center mm -hmm. industry and speaks more about the fundamental a fundamental element um, of the state of any country, any country's economy. It's, it's not... It's not only it not, not, does not only impact the data center um, industry. Now, saying that, from a co-location data center perspective, it is a big concern for clients um, as these facilities are very capex heavy um, facilities, and investors naturally would want guarantees on um, budgets to support their business cases. Um, considering they must make or commit large sums of money um, before they sell 
the data holes um, to prospective tenants. And so it's a large cash risk mm. um, to be looking at with this currency uh, fluctuation. This issue then creates this front this uh, front exposure then creates in itself a, 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 the approach of phased construction within data centers because one has to be able to manage this risk carefully. That requires you know due consideration between the designers and the contractors to ensure that you know there is safety in the process of construction. The that, that minimizes any downtime during the operation of the facilities. The issue in itself, you know, doesn't only impact on the design, but also from a contractor, um, from a contractor's perspective uh, on procurement in itself. Because again, you know, it, with, with fluctuation in exchange rates comes the risk of, you know, the initial quotations being outdated. So there, there, there are there are challenges that you know you you actually um, um, experience during the design, but also challenges you experience during the procurement stages by the contractor. Now, all this being said, this issue has been you know persistent in many of these countries and in, in particular for a while. So it is something that is well understood. And there are mitigation measures that have been developed um, for, 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 for some time to address some of these challenges, which would include, for one, you know, having a plan to procure equipment at a very early stage, you know, mm -hmm. having as part of your planning process, your budget planning process, you know, a mechanism to uh, perhaps make budgets based on parallel uh, markets exchange rates rather than the official um, central bank rates but also looking at you know how much contingency you allow as part of your projects um, to deal with this high level fluctuation but it is a risk that needs to be carefully managed Absolutely. Thanks, Felix. And I, I suppose, you know, one of the, the, the misconceptions is that when you're doing a phased data center, all of that infrastructure and all of that, those systems can also be phased, but that's not necessarily the case, is it? Um, to, to, an ex, to an extent, you can, you can phase some of the equipment, but I think the misconception is the proportion of <laughs> equipment that can be phased. There isn't, it, there isn't a linear relationship between the initial fit out and the infrastructure that needs to be provided. The, the initial stage will always demand a disproportionate installation of equipment upfront to allow that smooth, seamless integration of equipment to uh, accommodate the end of the, the, the last phase of your fit out. So it's always skewed, heavily skewed. And if I have to put a figure, I'll say probably the first phase will typically have probably 60% of the cost associated with the infrastructure. Okay, so um, thank you, Felix. Um, Ray, these the, the, the exchange rate volatility and... and, and, and um, some of these these issues are you are you seeing complications around imports um, and, and how does how does that impact uh, design considerations in Africa? Good question. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, so, Michelle, you know it's a very fine line between uh, quality and speed to market in the data center world. <laughs> you know, often we find the cookie cutter approach to design principles from a global perspective. Uh, in purposing a warehouse for a data center fit out, not necessarily fits the brief. You know, so one has to carefully consider the uh, the differences between a warehouse framework or a concrete purpose built facility. You know, so um, there are unique challenges uh, getting uh, you know capital equipment that are in big volume through customs. Certainly, logistics in moving the, these assets to site. Often, this equipment is very sensitive. 
so, you know, uh, there's, there's a lot of due diligence that's required in those early stages. We certainly find, you know, there's a, it's a fine line in investment uh, for data center investors and property investors likely, you know, so, you know, the upfront investment with the, uh, your, your core design team through uh, geotech surveys, environmental surveys, uh, certainly have a massive impact in taking the, the guessing game out of the complications, uh, you know, uh, and how this impacts the design considerations, you know, looking at, at the availability of current services um, that are in the area and, and certainly, you know, importing uh, versus local assembly is a very, very big part of what we look at critically, you know, in driving succession and, and enablement through local supporting uh, staff and uh, contracting entities, you know, so uh, thank you, Michelle. Sorry, Michelle, if I can hear you. Can you, talk? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, good. So, you know, I think we've been talking for a little while around this this push-pull between local versus international and what do you import and what do you build locally and so on. And I mean, it, it, it leads into, um, you know, local markets, local skills availability, um, sustainability, how you construct, um, you know, if, again, Felix, maybe you can just talk a little around how you make some of those decisions. Like why, why a concrete, traditional concrete and brick and fill or block and fill versus a steel frame, you know, as, a, as an example? Oh, Felix, now you go. Oh, there you go. <laughs> there, are, there, are, there are two aspects for me to the question. One is upskilling, upskilling um, uh, the, the, um, the, local, the local market or the region, the local region, and also how we design to take into consideration the skill, the presence skill sets and if we if we if we talk about the upskilling elements one we have to all ask, um, acknowledge that as the data center market is still young in west africa focusing on west africa there will be that natural shortage in skill sets uh considering data center designs are quite specialists in knowledge uh, or require specialist knowledge and capability so that's a given um, at the moment, most of this knowledge sits with international firms who are used to working with the larger uh, players in Europe and in America. Um, however, I do believe that this skill shortage is a short-term issue and the pool of the knowledge will deepen as you have more data centers emerge in Africa. Or West Africa in, in particular, since we focused on West Africa. Um, so the question then is how do we, you know, bridge the long-term issue, considering what we're talking about now is a short term. Now, I, I think there needs to be a conscious decision by the international design bodies or specialists to partner with local firms um as part of this upskilling process to ensure that there is a transfer of knowledge at this point in time you know uh, we we as an organization tend to rely on local partners and in doing that we try to you know impact the knowledge we've built over the years and only through that organic process will the design skills be um, leveled across the industry. But taking it, looking at in, from the installation and facility maintenance perspective, you also have these challenges. There is that shortage in skills. And again, as designers, we have to also consider that in our design processes, not simply implement approaches that we've adopted or built and are suitable for 
the uh, environments where you have matured markets, i.e. Europe or America, and where you have availability of products. But try to align our thinking to suit the local market, as Raymond had earlier, earlier mentioned. Not only from a design simplistic simplicity in design, but also from a selection of materials. So we are consciously using products that the local the local region are um, abreast with and is regionally available. I, I think a combination of these measures and others may provide a pathway to upskilling and addressing the skill shortage we, we, we presently um, experience. So, and Raymond, do you, you agree with that assessment that when it comes to skill shortages and, and local, local is better? Michelle, thank you. And, and just to expand on what Felix was highlighting, you know, the designing data is complex by nature and, you know, the reality of experience skills with a multidisciplinary capability and experience is very far and few between to find, you know. So they typically uh, aren't bred. <laughs> These are individuals that grow with the industry over time. And it certainly takes an average of 10 to 15 years to build on that capability. And, you know, these individuals are typically headhunted, um, not just locally, but certainly from an individual perspective. The greenbacks and sterling and euros seem very attractive for these individuals. So it's, it's quite important that we retain the talent through succession programs, uh, enablement, you know, uh, uh, through um, industry uh, standard organisations, tertiary education, uh, you know, and, and partnering very closely with local communities and tertiary educa educators locally is very important for us, you know, in, in enabling those, those individuals, uh, you know, certainly what we find, you know, the secret to um, retaining talent is simplicity in design. You know, often designers go off on the deep end with complex designs, uh, but, and it's it's very difficult to retain staff to maintain that reality. You know, so um, for us, with higher demand from business uh, and availability in systems to to support IT, um, it's really critical that uh, you know we we continually invest in people and uh, retain them through strategic initiatives, you know, whether it's um, rotational programs uh, for uh, staff to move around between data centers or service providers, uh, and certainly giving them the appetite to, to learn offshore as well is quite important to bring those essential skills back home. Thank you. Thanks, Raymond. Um, Johan Schneider is investing a lot in training. Tell us a little bit yeah, about sorry. I'm a little bit behind in the queue. I feel like I'm on, I'm on, a, I'm on a construction site and Ray and Felix entered with shovels and I get a teaspoon. They've already said it all. So <laughs> I'll, I'll be the site. So what Schneider normally does, you know, um, and, and, and we, I mean, we are partners with, with a lot of companies, uh, you know, Ray being one of them. Um, we invest a lot in training. We've got uh, excellent training facilities uh, at all our uh, major hubs. Uh, where there's experience centers, you know, guys can literally walk in and push the button. So we do engage a lot um, in that sense. We also employ when we do enter into a project uh, with one of our bigger customers. We always have the commitment to employ uh, some um, some of the resources, actively mentoring them, uh, you know, throughout the, the project uh, during, can we say, the implementation, which, which makes a lot of sense. So the guys get first-hand experience on how the products are built, how it's, uh, factory acceptance tested, how it's delivered, how it's commissioned, uh, going through the different levels of testing that's required for these data centers, which are quite stringent. Um, and then we basically transfer these resources to the end customer um, uh, for operations once the project is handed over. So we have agreements, formal agreements like that in place with some of our uh, bigger, uh, what we call country, uh, country multi-country targeted accounts and strategic accounts. Uh, but we've also entered into that same same agreement with some of our smaller customers. And it just makes sense because, uh, yes, there's definitely this lack of skills. And it's because for the last 10, 15 years, very few data centers or switches were built in Africa. And now suddenly we're in a ramp up phase. But luckily, there's a, there's enough gray beards left, you know, to, to sort of bring the new guys into the industry. Thank you. Wendy? 
Um, not just a pretty face. We've been talking I was about say, it. It's much, it's been. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we've been talking about skills shortages. We've mm -hmm. been talking about design implications and imports and all of this stuff. And and I'm sure these investors and these property developers are just hearing ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. <laughs> so talk to us about how, you know, good cost estimates are, mm -hmm. are um, essential in this, the, you know, to mitigate some of these risks that we see. Um, absolutely. I think, um, you know, we touched on it at the beginning and how important it is um, for these cost estimates to be right um, up front, the due diligence to make sure that we are allowing for certain infrastructure to come to the site if, if we're short on power for that site. Um, you know, but making a careful decision around the budget up front. Um, you know, one of the things we've seen on one or two projects where budgets have been tight, we've seen a major slowdown on projects um, and the delivery is normally impacted if the budget initially wasn't set at the right numbers. Um, another big factor we touched on earlier was around the phasing and, and like Felix indicated, you know, making sure that the client understands that phasing that isn't a linear number and that that first phase is going to dig into your pockets quite a bit. Um, and you need to pay that so that you can build the infrastructure so that you're not switching off in between when you're doing upgrades and adding additional halls to your facilities. Um, another one that maybe we don't speak about much, but often where there's an RFS date, um, a ready for service date that's maybe already been signed, you know, we need to make sure that our budgets allow for that um, so that we can buy the program that has the dates that we want. Um, and I know that from a cost manager is maybe not what I should be saying, but the reality is, you know, the back end of that comes with a, a lot of huge penalties. So we need to consider that there's sometimes there are costs that need to be associated with accelerating programs. Um, yeah, and I think also, like you mentioned, the procurement strategies. We, um, we, I think the first thing with procurement strategies is understanding or, or doing an initial assessment of what suppliers are in the market in your region. So not just um, deciding, um, you know, one of the big suppliers can provide, but looking at what they can provide you operationally down the line. Um, and whether or not they can keep the local spares in market so that you're not buying huge amount of spares. Um, you know, those things are important and understanding what the client wants to do as direct procurement. I know, Felix, you, you mentioned earlier about uh, Forex and, and, you know, the fluctuations of Forex, but also having that discussion with a developer up front about whether or not certain of his financing might be in dollars or in euros to secure certain pieces of equipment at the right currency rather than, um, you know, sitting with the local currency for those items. And then building in the program risk around if you're yes. going to provide those items yourself. Absolutely. So, I mean, there, yeah, there's always a trade-off, like we keep talking about this pull, push and pull, but understanding if you're going to do direct procurement, you're taking risk on if you're not leaving it with your contractor. Um, but I guess that's a, it's an item that needs to be listed down in the, and looked at the mitigations and which is your best scenario in which region. I think we've also spoken about, especially in the likes of Nigeria or, or other countries, is understanding how you import and where those costs are sitting in your budgets. Yeah, I think, you know, when you're delivering data centers, it is a triangle between cost, time and quality. And mm -hmm. somewhere along the line, you don't want one of those to fall off. And generally in data centers, time does take precedence. It's kind of at the apex. But if you know that up front, then you need to understand the costs that go with that. Um, I agree. And I think if we just add one more to, and then it's not a triangle, but I guess it's your health and safety. And that's one thing that I was going to bring into this whole discussion. We've been talking about design, we're talking about costs, but DCs are complicated. And when you're energizing them and when you're building these things, lots can go wrong. And, and we have these global big players in the data center space, and they put a huge premium on health and safety. And, and we can't go into this looking at it as a you know another local market construct. We have to to really look at health and safety and prioritize it when we're looking at design, because operationally we need to carry that through. 
um, and in the construction and in, in the long-term serviceability. And as you say, when you're integrating your next phases in and so on, all of this needs to be done safely. So, you know, and, uh, you know, if you if you understand DCs, when you're gonna you're gonna provide costs for that extra thing up front. Absolutely. Um, I certainly would say that you need to add a premium in, certainly from a, a prelims point of view for your main contractor. I think it's really important um, to make sure that you're conscious that there are going to be requirements that maybe they wouldn't have normally anticipated. Absolutely. Um, I think uh, then just... Uh, so we've, we've talked a bit about supply chain. We've talked about, you know, the, the these trade-offs, um, talked a bit about costs. Um, what about sustainability? Uh, Felix, you know, and, and, and well, let's start with Raymond. Um, investor expectations around net zero. Everybody says that net zero can't be done in data centers. So, you know, maybe we should talk a little about that. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. I guess Felix is the expert on that, but you know, in principle, you know, sustainable solutions for data centers is long in the making. Uh, we certainly look at it critically around uh, sustainability of, of utility supplies and natural resources and availability thereof uh, in the location, uh, in proximity to the location of the site, you know, so uh, whether it's water supply and sustainability of the water supply, the treatment of the water, as an example, so it's, uh, you know, electricity is a very big part of that. So, you know, whether there's enough land space available for renewables uh, through solar or what we're seeing in various geographies across Africa, which is super exciting, is the geotech, uh, you know, so uh, biomass uh, type investments for renewables, um, gas investments. Uh, so there certainly is a, a great variety of resources available. It's really how do we design around the availability of those resources, you know, and uh, from an entity DD point of view, it certainly is a massive uh, um, opportunity in how we drive that home by 2030 as, as a key initiative for us uh, to drive down those uh, carbon uh, uh, initiatives and sustainability. So, Felix, I suppose that brings me to my next question, which is around um, you, you know, we spoke earlier a little about, you know, why do you go with a concrete frame versus a steel frame? Because it helps with sustainability if that's, you know, if you're not importing steel and, and so on. But there's also this, again, trade-off between do you do shell and core? Do you bring prefabricated units in? Is it a mixture of both? How do you make those decisions in an African context? Very good question. And before I before I um, respond to the question specifically, I just want to add um, a, a point to what Raymond has said. Totally agree with everything. But I think, I think up until this point, there's been this focus on energy when we talk about sustainability. Sustainability transcends that; it goes beyond beyond um, energy. Uh, data centers have driven their efficiency really hard and they are, i'll tell you are really effective facilities but sustainability has to do with empowering local communities as well it has to do with um, um, a responsible sourcing of materials i think we've talked about you know look utilizing local products rather than having to ship products because of the carbon footprints and x y and there, there are a whole heap of things and simply looking at simply looking at um, uh, frameworks like the UNSDGs will provide insights to a lot of things that can be considered as part of any DC developments. Um, so I think, I think yes, uh, probably there needs to be a shift in our thinking around just energy to a full sustainable development. But to your question on Shell and core um, prefabrication. Um, I think it's it's not a case of either or because both solutions generally provide valuable benefits to um, to to the clients, but have to be evaluated against project needs in terms of IT capacity, in terms of speed of deployments, which you emphasized earlier on, um, cost. Cost is a big thing. And I guess there's always that misconception. 
one which is uh, cheaper. Um, and probably that is based on the established knowledge within um, uh, matured markets. Um, there is also the issue of construction quality that comes into all this. So there are, there are loads of factors that needs to be considered in making the decision. And only going through that process would one arrive at the most appropriate solution for a specific project. However, we've just been talking about sustainability and that I think should now be considered as one of the critical thinking, one of the critical factors over and beyond simply speed to market or cost. The footprints, the carbon footprints, looking at prefabrication of shipping a pre-constructed facility outside the country will be huge compared to what it would normally be if you were to prefabricate, if we were to use a prefabricated unit in Europe. Also, the cost, again, could be quite substantial if you compare a prefabricated solution in Europe as against West Africa. And the point I'm trying to make here is prefabrication is good. However, there is a missing element that needs to be considered as part of this discussion. So the location of manufacture, sorry, the location of manufacture plays a significant part. And as present, as, as far as I'm aware, and really stand to be corrected, there is no facility in West Africa that manufactures prefabricated DCs. So that, that probably provides an opportunity for a shift in things you know do we get the manufacturers of all these units involved in this discussion what are understand the challenges and obstacles to setting up assembly plants as a start mm -hmm. and probably in, in future manufacturing facility only through that would I, I do i really believe we will address the key issue around sustainability of using prefabrication. But irrespective of all this, both of our, both of our um, uh, suitable benefits in, 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 in the industry and has to be evaluated appropriately. I think when we talk about prefabricated versus shell and core, we're we looking at those pre prefabricated modular designs for DCs. But I suppose the, the the hybrid trick here, Johan, is prefabricated energy centers. Are you seeing a shift yeah, so, in how that works? Yeah, so, you know, in terms of, of delivering both solutions, Schneider has, has, has done many of both uh, and in different areas as well. And Felix, uh, I stand corrected to say that we actually do have a partner in Nigeria that has done one small prefab uh, very successfully. We also have the same in South Africa. So we are looking at localizing it. I think uh, East Africa is up next for us. Um, definitely the cost of, of, of shipping. Uh, and, and again, we're looking um, <clears throat> at, uh, at a lot of presentations that's being thrown around in the market, uh, telling people that uh, prefab is 2% cheaper and 40% faster to market. It's not the case in Africa, taking again into consideration that, you know, most of these data centers traditionally were built in, in, in America and then later Europe and elsewhere. So in Africa, we found that prefab is a little bit more expensive and it can even be a lot more expensive. But again, uh, when it comes back to your statement that we do not know what uh, brick and mortar is day one, day two or even final day, you know, so your variation orders is definitely uh, one of the things that I think prefab will, will limit to a, a, a very big extent. Um, Michelle, answering your question in terms of hybrid, uh, we've seen some of the bigger internet giants and, and, the, and the major colos moving this direction already a few years ago. So when it comes to the, the real complex solutions, uh, like your energy centers, your medium voltage, low voltage switch gear, UPSs, even hydronic modules with your pumping stations and motor controls, etc., it does make sense. Um, putting these on open skids, moving them into building rooms uh, or even in prefabricated modules with uh, fireproof rated walls, etc. So in general, I think one of the best solutions we found uh, that there's a balance between speed to market and everything else uh, would be looking at prefabricating your 
your power and, and mechanical infrastructure and then doing your white space or your data holes, uh, the traditional methods. But yeah, sustainability is changing a lot of things. Even in the last couple of months, we've seen it. Um, uh, weighing up the options between, you know, using prefabricated steel walls against brick and mortar. Uh, you know, cement is one of your most uh, carbon intensive products to, to, to mine. So it's everything has to be taken into consideration. And as Felix rightfully said, there's a place for both. It really depends on what the customer's needs are um, and what the speed to market requirements are. Thank you. Thanks, Johan. Um, I think with the, we, we, we've got about 10 or 15 minutes left, and maybe it's a, a good time to, to switch and talk about standards um, and best practice. And, you know, so, so we, we, there's a, a number of mistakes that have been made around the world and, you know, th th that Africa can learn from. Um, designing for resilience is one of those. And we often talk, we hear all this jargon around tier one and tier two and tier three. Um, Johan, can you just give us a little bit of a breakdown on, uh, around unpacking these best practices um, versus standards or, you know, um, you know what, what's the most popular tier in Africa? How does this work? Yeah, so um, it's a good question, Michelle. But, um, look, there, there are many forms of uh, or forums and societies. Uh, a lot of us refer to them as standards, and, and I've been recently uh, sort of rightfully guided in that direction. Um, so these are continuously improving. They're continuously adapting, and they have to meet um, also you know regional demands. Uh, they have to keep track of, of, of these new sustainability ambitions that, that's coming through. Um, I mean, there's, there's TUV, there's IEC, Bixi, TIA. I don't want to favor anybody, so sorry if I missed somebody out. There's EIA, and uh, the more recognized to us here in Africa is basically, uh, <laughs> you know, there's, there's basically, you know, the uptime standards, or which are not standards, they are really um, a society that, that's been supporting the data center industry for, for the last decade or so. <clears throat> I think the key thing here is to, is to collaboratively seek, um, you know, really to, to focus the attention on the resilience of the data center and not lose focus of the state sustainability goals. Um, you know, as I said, these are very new to us. Uh, every time there's a COP, COP26 is just behind us, and, and that's already changed the goals again. Um, <clears throat> coming back to your second question, I think the most popular uh, standard or tier, uh, basically, is, is tier three design. Um, which typically gives you 99 point, a couple of nines and a six odd year percentage uptime. But again, you know, a lot of the guys think this is guaranteed. Uh, there's probably 80, 90% of the data centers are certified tier three, or at least claim to be certified tier three. You have to be careful. Um, certification costs a lot of money. Um, if it's not certified, you can't claim this because ultimately the society or the standard will Will, will take action against you if you if you throw their way throw their names around to to attract customers. <clears throat> but um, yeah, what we found is is really uh, you know your everybody wants a tier four data center when it comes to the design uh, requirements, uh, but they are only willing to pay for a tier one data center. And again, don't skip the certification. Um, it makes sense. Uh, what we've also found is. We've got uh, longer grid outages uh, than your typical tier designs were made for Europe and, Afri and America and so on. So uh, what we do from Schneider's point of view is most of our partners and most of our customers actually accept this is we, we do have a little bit of a hybrid between a tier three and a tier four. So typically our, our infrastructure is power and, 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 and cooling is designed around tier three uh, standards. But uh, when it comes to energy storage, you know, we typically see 24, 48 hours of, of fuel. Um, and we even see 2N or 2N plus one redundancy on, on UPSs and cooling. So we do tend to take that into consideration um, when it comes to what, what the real requirement is in terms of resilience. Do we really need tiers in Africa? Do you, is this a, a you know something that um, you know the big players are, are, are really required to to have, or is it um, you know do they have their own standards? Uh, so no, the big boys have their own standards. Uh, many of them are not um, in in Europe and in, in the US. Um, are not actually certified. They they do a lot of their switching uh, upstream on the medium voltage side, even and even at high voltage. 
but we have seen these guys moving into Africa and expecting, uh, you know, at least tier compliances. And we have also seen some of them uh, doing tier certification. And I think it's pressure that coming from the customer to the one extent, but it's also a lack of of standard standards in, in Africa that uh, some of these societies have been able to sort of create a standard, if I can put it that way. Thanks, Johan. So, um, Wendy, I think the last question uh, before we, we sort of conclude all of this is, is for you. And that's really about landowners, developers, investors. How can they best collaborate with data center consultants in West Africa um, to, to get the best locations um, and the best uh, operators? Absolutely. Um, so, I mean, I must admit, this is something that we've been quite in, integral in in the last, look at me, can't get my words right, um, in the last little while. And that's really talking to some of the land owners around their land and what the data center providers are looking for. Um, you know, we, we mentioned earlier about due diligences. Um, and in a way, what you could do as a landowner, if, if you think you've got a piece of land that potentially is worthwhile looking at, is maybe ticking off some of those initial due diligence uh, requirements, um, which just really puts your piece of land ahead of maybe some others. Um, and that's really just going through um, looking at the power availability on your site. I think we've mentioned that already. What you what your immediate availability is, as well as what you you may have. Um, gotten from a power provider that you can get in the future. So really having that jotted down, um, looking at your your fiber and your location in relation to some of the other data center providers. Um, I think we've spoken about some of these already, but like your, fl um, your flood risks, um, where residential areas are in relation to your, your piece of land. And, and I think also specifically in Africa, considering your security um, and like you said, not necessarily your IT security, but your security of, of your site. Because um, I think that's something that certainly we've picked up on quite a few of our projects in, in Africa has, has really been that even though there are standards globally for these data center providers, generally there's a requirement for more. So um, when, when we're dealing with um, sites in Africa. Um, and, and maybe one of the other things um, that's quite a good um, thing to do is really to possibly get someone involved in looking at a master plan of your site, of what the capacity is that you could possibly fit on that site, um, and, and linking that up to your power availability. I think that certainly gives um, a client a really good indication of, of what you can bring to the table. And I think certainly just making sure that you um, you you bring you know you bring this forward to the potential data center providers so that they understand what you're bringing that maybe the other site isn't. And certainly if if you have a piece of land that already has the power, you're probably ten steps ahead of most other landowners. Okay, so I think um, it's been a very interesting discussion. And I, if, I, if I look at some of the, the key takeaways, um, what you're saying is, uh, number one, spend more money up front. So your due diligence <laughs> on your site, uh, understanding the capacity of your site, um, you know, understanding if your location is good, all of that. And it's, it's not as a, a simplistic as, as with other developments and, and investors and developers should look at spending more money up front. Um, I think one of the other things is that we took take away from this is, is looking at local solutions. I think we've talked about uh, skills, we've talked about um, you know long-term maintenance and operating requirements, and, and that local solutions generally work better. Um, and as Ray put it, I think cookie cutter designs don't always work um, in Africa. Um, We've also talked uh, a lot about it being data centers being capital he capital heavy up front. So um, I think Felix, you mentioned that uh, you know your your phasing isn't always linear. Something for for our investors to look at. Um, and then uh, and I think one of the last one I think was sustainability is not just about electricity. Um, 
So I think, you know, I don't know if we just want to go around the room and just, you know, see if there's any points that we need to add or, or, or final conclusions, but those were, were my takeaways from this. I don't know, maybe start with you, Felix. Absolutely. I think you 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 summarize it, you know, aptly. Um, uh, but just to emphasize on the sustainability um, element of this, we, we've talked about a lot of very important, uh, um, a very important um, um, aspects of data center design, construction, and operation. Um, but one thing that's inevitable and never going to leave, irrespective of the sector. But more importantly, uh, as we discuss in the center, is sustainable development, um, be it energy or any other form. I know uh, you, um, Johan mentioned about COP, uh, the seminar just um, um, completed in Glasgow recently. Um, the, the centers in themselves are inherently efficient, but there is a huge opportunity, especially in the context of Africa, to look beyond that and explore other opportunities that could provide a more sustainable development, empowering local communities, you know, increasing the wealth rather than driving, rather than shipping or in exporting wealth out, out of the country, you know, upskilling communities and just the whole general sustainable development measures. There is a huge opportunity with this young thriving um, industry to you know, ship um, the, the sustainable outcomes within Africa and we should grab it with both hands. Absolutely. Uh, Raymond? Yes, yes, absolutely. And so from experience, you know, one of the critical things for us in building data centers is partnering early with a really good design team that have got the right levels of experience across all 14 engineering practices uh, and bringing that home. You know, uh, traditional architects uh, like to build fancy buildings with good look and feel to it. Uh, in the data center world, it's about coordination of services. You know, and bringing that home is quite complex, you know, to what uh, Felix was touching on. And, you know, maximizing and caching on the available footprint of the property is really an investor's uh, 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 peril, you know, and uh, certainly uh, drives home lower cost of operations, you know, so, uh, and uh, investing in key skills up front is, is also a, a critical area for us that we, 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 we like to look in. And I think just Johan touched on some of the best practices. You know, there they, they certainly is a myth between consultants in uh, which is best fit for what type of design. You know, one has to look at it critically in standards. There's only one authorized standard for data centers. And certainly uh, looking at the, the shell and core, the facility against standards uh, versus the engineering practices is quite critical, you know, and bringing that home to what Wendy was saying in. Uh, security um, for the uh, for the properties is quite critical you know so it's not just electrical it's not just mechanical it's environmental it's the whole package that that really brings home a rich experience and good returns you know i've, I've always felt uh, strongly you know the, the a good upfront investment uh, will drive home good operational sustainability and high returns thank you thanks johan yeah, I didn't even get it. I didn't even get a teaspoon this time. Um, <laughs> so basically, Ray said it all. Um, you know, building a data center requires a, a very strong professional team up front. And I think if you, as an investor, want to to walk into this, um, we've recently seen it. There's no such thing as an EBIT or E auction or a reverse E auction. This is something that you really partner with a strong professional team where you can see collaboration between the consultants and the suppliers and the architects and, and, and everybody that's involved in the solution. So this is not a normal building. <clears throat> it is really critical or mi mission critical infrastructure. And if we've been around, you know, we sort of see these faults coming. Ray would see it better and faster than I do because he's, I think he's got two or three years more experience than, than me. But um, it's, it's, it's critical that you lay your foundation strong before you build that data center. Not when you build it, you do it again, but before you build it. No, absolutely, and I think it's it's it, it is such a systems intensive structure that you have to have that coordination, you have to have that strong design team, and I think Wendy 
all of our takeaways probably lead to making your life slightly easier in the cost space. So anything that you need to add? Yes. You need no, I, <laughs> no I, I definitely think everyone sort of hit on a lot of the points, you know. Um, we do have quite a small group of people that do have the skill set to do this type of work. Um, and, and I guess it's part of our jobs to almost expand that, that pool of people um, so that we can continue to deliver these projects um, at the standard that our clients are expecting them to come. Thank you. Um, thanks. For, it's been a very lively discussion. I think it's been very interesting. I think we've covered a lot of different areas and um, it's been very nice to have you all on board. Thanks, um, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your, your comments. And I think I want to start from how we closed uh, with the emphasis on planning and uh, coordination. And, and I think um, quite a number of countries, let's not even go uh, deep drill into organizations, uh, quite a number of countries will have to maybe form strategic teams and um, um, get people on the back of emphasizing planning around because I mean, as you know, I was hearing comment from Johan, Raymond, Felix, Wendy. My mind just kept going to the various standards that we would need to change in country, the various uh, things we would need to uh, deploy. So it's been a very uh, engaging and intensive uh, uh, session, technically uh, speaking. So thank you all very much and michelle I, I i love to bounce back you know despite the technical issues so uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was not what it really was so um, um thank you all once again um for being a part of this and also to our audience um,